Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Teflin webinar series number two. My name is Nita Liando from Universitas Negeri Manado. Today, I'm acting as the moderator for a two hour webinar organized by Teflin Sulawesi Maluku Papua Regional Board in collaboration with British Council Indonesia. First and foremost, we should give thanks to God for his abundant blessings that allow us to meet this afternoon in this webinar. It is obvious that with the current situation of COVID-19 pandemic, the world of education, including the field of English language teaching has been widely affected. Consequently, many changes occur. For example, a learning activity that shifts from face-to-face -face learning process to online learning. Various remote learning facilities were utilized through some platforms, for instance, Zoom, WebEx, Google Meet. Now, in response to this, Teflin Sumapa Regional Board, in collaboration with British Council Indonesia, present a webinar with the theme, Looking Back and Forth, English Language Te Teaching in Time of Crisis. Before we proceed, let me inform you some housekeeping matters. Since this webinar has attracted thousands of participants, then it is broadcasted through YouTube live streaming British Council Indonesia channel. And during this webinar, participants who wish to ask questions may post them in the comment box. And then if possible, please write to whom your questions is being addressed. At the end of the seminar, a link of certificate, e-certificate, and a feedback survey will be shared. All right, guys, I hope you would enjoy this two hour webinar and please stay with us. I would like now to give the chance for the remarks by coordinator of Teflin Sumapa Regional Board, Dr. Hyril Karongba. The floor is yours. Dr. Korompa, please. Sorry. So once again, uh, a very good afternoon to, to everyone. Um, I'm speaking here on behalf of Teflin Sulawesi Maluku and Papua, which is a part of uh, Teflin. TEFLIN stands for the Association for the Teaching of English as a Foreign Language in Indonesia, uh, which is established in 1970 in Yogyakarta. TEFLIN is probably the oldest, the largest, most active, and most prestigious professional organization of English language educators in Indonesia. It has thousands of active members, individuals, and institutions, both in Indonesia and from all over the world. It is run by a national board consisting of board of advisors, executives, and regional coordinators. And we are all currently led by President Professor Dr. Joko Nurkamto, MPD. In, in the region of Sulawesi, Maluku, and Papua, uh, we are represented by uh, members in Sulawesi Utara or North Sulawesi. We are represented by Dr. Nita Liando, who is the moderator today. In Gorontalo, we are represented by Dr. Rasunat Kali. In Sulawesi Tengah, we are represented by Dr. Mohtar Marhum. In Sulawesi Barat, we are represented by Dr. Umar. In Sulawesi Selatan, we are represented by Rusdiana Junaid. In Sulawesi Tenggara, our member is Albert, Dr. Albert. In Maluku, we are represented by school teacher Maria Meike Eka Dewi Bacaran. In Maluku Utara, we are represented by Dr. Sutario. In Papua, we are represented by Dr. Lalu Sudirman, and in Papua Barat, we are represented by Bapak Alphonse Napoleon Arsai. 
Um, and about the webinar today, um, it has been briefly uh, described by uh, Dr. Nitaliando, uh, the uh, rationale behind this webinar. And I want to echo that in uh, this on this occasion. Um, so we are facing the reality today that COVID-19 is a global crisis with both positive and negative long-term effects. Uh, we know that teachers and students and institutions have been greatly affected uh, in both good ways and both uh, bad ways. Uh, online learning is not new, but uh, what about switching to it in its maximum extent? That's the question we have to uh, respond to. And then we have to also answer the question, how, how do we all cope with it? With the, with the crisis and the challenges that the crisis possess, poses. Um, we are, are we ready for the implications of this new normal for English language teaching in the short and long run? And finally, we need to answer the question, uh, what do experts, teachers, students, governments, and communities in Indonesia and the rest of the world have to say and offer? And we hope that uh, by the end of this webinar, we will be able to answer uh, all or some of these questions together. Thank you and have a uh, productive webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Korompot. Now I would like to give the next chance to Prof. Joko Nurkamto as the Taklin president to deliver his speech. The floor is yours. Thank you, Book. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, on behalf of National Tefillin Board, I would like to welcome you all to this virtual conference hosted and organized by Tefillin Sulawesi, Maluku and Papua, yeah, Sumapa, in cooperation with British Council Indonesia. Secondly, I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation to Pak Hadah Karnbat, PhD, the area coordinator of Teflin, Sulawesi, Maluku, and Papua, who has organized this academic activity. In addition, I also wish to convey my appreciation to British Council Jakarta for the support, without which the webinar never takes place. We hope that the cooperation between Teflin and British Council is getting stronger in the future. Furthermore, my thanks also go to the committee for all of their hard work, which has made this conference possible. The theme of this webinar, as Pak Haidel Karnabat said, is looking back and forth English language teaching in the time of crisis. I think this is an appropriate theme for the conference today at the time of pandemic. We need to evaluate the implementations of teaching especially LT, in which teachers and lecturers are encouraged to carry out online teaching. We need to identify the strengths and the weaknesses of the enactment of the, of the teaching and learning and take appropriate actions to plan and better teaching. It may happen that online teaching and learning will become a trend in the future, regardless of whether or not there is a pandemic. So in this respect, I'm confident that the speaker will elaborate the themes appropriately. So in this case, allow me to express my special gratitude to the speaker of the conference, Pak Willy Renandia, PhD from Singapore. And then Pak Paul Goldberg, PhD, ex-reading, Pak Paul uh, pa Dons from this council, and Ibu Ani Nunu, PhD from Wen Malang for their availability and a willingness to share their knowledge and expertise. My thanks also go to the participants of the conference, without whom there would be no conference. Finally, I hope that all the part presenter and participants will enjoy this conference. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Joko, for your opening remarks. Now, we would like now to go through the presentations of the speakers. As you have seen in the flyers that this webinar presents four presentations. And I would like to introduce our speakers today. 
And I would like to start first from Dr. Willy Renandia. Pak Willy, let me call me like this. It sounds much familiar. Pak Willy is very popular among English teachers and lecturers in Indonesia and abroad. And for those who join Teacher Voices, an FB account should know him well. Now, Pak Willy is based in Singapore and affiliated with National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technology University. He has much passions in the ELT field. Dr. Ananya will be speaking about ELT in blended learning environments, challenges, and opportunities. Our second speaker is Paul Goldberg. He has taught English as a foreign language in various places, such as Venezuela, Spain, Korea, the US, and most recently at Kwansei Gakuen University in Osaka. His main areas of interest are extensive reading and extensive listening. Paul is the founder of X Reading, which he developed because of his desire to make graded readers more accessible for students and extensive reading programs easier for teachers to manage. Paul will be speaking about extensive reading in time of crisis. The third speaker is Colm Dones. He is currently the Director, English Education and Society at the British Council Indonesia. Colm has extensive experience in English for academic purposes, English for specific purposes, publishing Cambridge English for Job Hunting for Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, and also an English for UN Peacekeepers. Colm will be speaking about how English teachers are responding to COVID-19 around the world. Last but not least, the fourth presentation is entitled Learning Disruptive, Learning Rethought, Lessons from COVID-19 Pandemic. This research is a collaboration between Dr. Hairil Anwar Parompot and Dr. Anik Nunuk Mulyani. However, this presentation today will be delivered by Ibu Anik Nunuk Mulyani. Now let me briefly introduce Ibu Anik. She is an academic staff at Department of English, Faculty of Letters, Universitas Negeri Malang, Indonesia, obtaining her PhD from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand in 2017. Her research interests include teacher professional development, English skill courses, and English language teaching. As for Dr. Karompot, he is currently serving as the coordinator of Eflin Sumapa Regional Board and a faculty member of English Department, Faculty of Languages and Literature, Universitas Negeri Makassar, Indonesia. Okay, these are the brief introduction for the speakers and without further ado, I'll give the first chance to Dr. Willy Renania. Please, Dr. Willy. Thank you, thank you very much. Bonita, can you please leave your microphone on? Sure. Yes, yep. leave your microphone on, yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, yep. yes. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the topic of my presentation today is ELT in blended learning environment, challenges and opportunities. I want you to underline challenges and opportunities. In particular, I would like you to think about the many, many opportunities that have opened up uh, for us during these difficult times, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, let me start with this familiar uh, saying, every cloud has a silver lining. Dalam bahasa Indonesia, pengharapan itu selalu ada di balik awan yang gelap. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with this. I'm sure you believe that this is actually true. But what I want you to think about is this. Do not, you do not have to wait for the silver lining because you yourself can be that silver lining. And that is you typing away your computers, planning your lesson, uh, developing activities and tasks for your students. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have been very, very familiar with this classroom setting. Very familiar place for us. The teacher is there, the students are there, and there's a lot of interaction that happens in the classroom. We are also familiar with this context, this situation where students bring in their computers and the teachers also organize their lessons using some form of blended learning in a classroom. But how many of us are ready for this type of learning when the students are not there with you 
when the learning is done uh, remotely. Now let us assess the situation together. You've been teaching remotely for a few months now. How would you assess yourself in terms of your success in delivering your lessons online? Do you think your report card has been good, excellent, just okay, or not very good or poor? Boo, Nita, you've been teaching for a while, yeah? Yep. Yes, so how would you assess yourself in terms of your ability to engage students in the online learning environment? Good, excellent, maybe, okay, or poor? Maybe good. <laughs> maybe good. <laughs> I think you are overestimating your ability a bit. If I were to assess myself, I think it's just okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the first time around, it was very, very badly done. Yeah, exactly. Very, very poor. I'm sure the other panel members will agree with me. But my, my, my message to you is don't feel too bad about this. Let's look at what happened in the US or what is happening in the US. Uh, there's a report recently that appeared in the Wall Street Journal. Now, remember, this is the USA, okay? Not Indonesia, not other developing countries, but the USA. Now, the report is interesting to me because it provided an objective assessment, if you ask me, about the uh, uh, implementation of the uh, remote learning uh, experiments or remote learning activities in the US. Now, here is the result, mm -hmm. at least according to this newspaper. The results are in uh, for remote learning, yeah. and it did not work. The pandemic has forced schools into a crash course on in online education and problems piled up very quickly. And many teachers find it very hectic and also extremely uh, successful. Uh, I'm so, not successful, but stressful. Okay, why is that? Now, here are some of the things that, that was reported in that newspaper. Number one. I think you will agree with this assessment that remote learning is vastly different from in-person learning that we are familiar with. Vastly means very, very, very different. Number two, there's a lot of things that teachers don't know about. They don't know how to uh, you know, utilize the uh, digital technology, the, uh, all the uh, possibilities that the uh, technology has enabled some teachers to do, but for the majority, uh, you know, it continues to be very challenging. And this is what some of them have said. For most of them, it's like learning to build a plane, which is a very difficult job, and learning how to fly it at the same time, because the COVID-19 happened just like that at the same time. So learning two things, two difficult things at the same time is an almost impossible job. But some teachers have been able to do it quite well, and, but the majority are not able to do it well. Now, here are some of the reasons for the uh, failure. Number one, remember this is the USA, yeah? Even in the USA, uh, according to the newspaper, 20% of them have no access. 20% of the children in schools have no computer or internet access. I can imagine how many students in Indonesia, for example, have very limited access to the internet. The number I'm sure is very much higher. Number two, parents who are supposed to help their children at home, they're not trained and plus they have to juggle too many things at home. You know, uh, looking after the kids, helping them with their studies and also in the meantime, they have to work, uh, you know, from home as well. Not to mention if they have husbands, who are not the easiest people you know, at home for some of the uh, families. And the teachers are not very prepared. Even the most experienced teachers look very much like complete beginners in their teaching. So it's very challenging. And support from the school is also quite minimal. But the most important thing to me is this. We often assume that children are good computer users. Yes, they are very good with their little gadgets. They are very good at socializing using their mobile phones and all the many applications, but they are not very good digital learners yet. What it means is that digital learning requires a new set of skills and our children are not yet there. 
at the moment. Okay, you may be wondering, because this is what is happening in some of the uh, schools in Western countries. They get very excited about the implementation of digital technology and they start, you know, uh, you know, buying computers and tablet computers for the whole school so that the students can start learning and reading, uh, finding information from, uh, from the screen instead of from the print. Now, after a few years, uh, people began to be interested in finding out whether or not there is a difference in terms of, you know, the level of comprehension that happens when student, when children read print books or screen uh, materials. So which one do you think will result in, in deeper comprehension for the kids? Ipunita, what is your best guess? Printed books. Printed books. Is there any particular reason for that? Why printed books? Why not screen books? Uh, because, you know, it hurts my eyes to look at, you know, screens all the time if I read ebooks. Okay. Yes. Apparently, ebooks or digital reading uh, is okay when you read for, you know, general information, when you read for mm -hmm. pleasure, that's fine. Yeah. But for serious reading, I think print reading, at least for now, is still uh, superior to screen reading. I think that's a very exciting piece of uh, research that I've learned uh, in the past few years. The way forward for us is this. Number one, I think about Joko mentioned this early on, blended learning has been around, but how many of us have actually implemented blended learning? Going to be very, very, very popular. Learning in and out of the classroom, in particular, learning out of the classroom because there's now so much information out there and the students can be encouraged and, and also can be taught how to find information. And because of that, we need to also teach information literacy skills to our students, how to find, how to screen, how to select and how to use information in a very responsible manner uh, for learning purposes and also for social purposes. Now, uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, I will uh, share with you my thoughts about what teachers need to have and need to do uh, in terms of three major uh, areas, in terms of you know, what they need to have in their head, in terms of their heart, and in terms of the kind of things that they need to do in order to promote uh, blended learning environments. The first one is the head. Okay, the, the head, our head, the head of a teacher will need to be filled with a lot of new knowledge, in particular knowledge related to their uh, profession. They need to upgrade their professional knowledge. They also need to have a new set of principles that will guide their teaching. They will also need to incorporate what we know about 21st century skills, including the four competencies. Let me begin with the first one. I think many of us are familiar with this. In the old days, during our training days as teachers, we were told that a teacher need to have content knowledge, subject matter knowledge, and also pedagogical knowledge. And when we put this together, uh, you need to have what has been called pedagogical content knowledge. So a math teacher, for example, we need to know enough about math. We need to know enough about its pedagogy and we, they need to know how to blend the two for, like, for teaching purposes in the classroom. But today, this is no longer sufficient. This is not enough. I think we need to upgrade our knowledge, our professional knowledge, and include another important component, which is technology. <clears throat> and this has been called TPAC, or technological pedagogical content knowledge. We need to add, uh, you know, technology in our content, we need to add technology in our pedagogy, and we need to be able to use technology for teaching our subject matter. Now, this, of course, is another challenge for many teachers. Uh, I know teachers are users of, you know, digital gadgets, but they may themselves may not be uh, digital teachers yet. Teachers who can use 
be a digital technology for teaching purposes in the classroom. So that's point number one, upgrading their knowledge to include, their professional knowledge to include technology uh, in the way they deliver their content and in the way they use pedagogy that is well aligned with the uh, new development in technology. I will now share with you six of the most important principles of good teaching with or without technology, in particular with technology in mind. Now here are six of them. Number one is the idea that learning will have to be personalized, learning will have to be meaningful. We need to pay attention to the need of every single student in our classroom. This is the idea behind differentiated learning. It's been around for a while, but I think with technology, I think we can make this uh, you know, easier. Technology can make personalization in our teaching uh, easier. The second one is the notion behind engaged learning. Engaged learning uh, is one that allows students to learn optimally in your lesson. Just want you to remember this rule, the 90-90 rule. Your job as a teacher is to be able to engage 90% of your students 90% of the time. And for that to happen, you need to make sure that your classroom is a safe environment, cognitively, emotionally, and also socially for your students. And that way, chances are higher that your students may be or will be engaged in their learning. The, fact, the next one is authentic learning. Authentic learning. Yes, in the classroom, we do things that are good for the classroom learning purposes, but we also need to remember that doing school alone is not enough. We need to make explicit attempt to link what happens in the classroom to what it is that the students will need to do outside uh, the classroom. So the idea of doing school and also doing life at the same time. Feedback continues to be important, especially targeted feedback, the kind of feedback that is ongoing, the kind of feedback that is appropriate for different students in your classroom, the weaker students, the stronger students, they need feedback from you. For some of us, you know, feedback may, may be seen as extra work. Yes, it is extra work, but it is a very, very important part of learning because when you give feedback, you are actually reteaching or teaching again things that were not very clear when you uh, deliver the lesson the first time around. Next one is deep learning as opposed to superficial learning. I think with technology, it is easier, it is more possible for you to organize the kind of learning that requires deeper level of learning or thinking in the classroom. Flip classroom is a great example where the students prepare well before they come to class. And then we use classroom time to engage students in deeper conversation, in problem solving, in looking at real complex problems, uh, you know, that is worth discussing in the classroom. And finally, collaborative learning. This one continue to be uh, important uh, in the old days without technology or even now with technology because people now believe that knowledge is socially constructed and when students work in groups, they're likely to learn more from their peers and also from the lessons delivered by the teacher. Let me just briefly look at the uh, four, uh, the uh, four C's of the 21st century competencies. Now, these ideas have been floating around for a while. I think the time is right now for us to actually pay attention to these four Cs and try to include this in our teaching. Communication skills, collaboration skills, critical thinking skills, and creativity. All these are important and we need to keep in mind when we plan our lesson, make sure that one of these Cs is included. Another important point is the notion behind culture. Uh, students, you know, have different, come from different learning backgrounds, different social cultural backgrounds, and we always need to pay attention to their learning culture uh, so that we can, uh, you know, provide the best kind of instruction for students coming from different social economic backgrounds and social uh, cultures as well. So that is pretty much the head. We need a lot of professional knowledge, and this knowledge will have to be uh, upgraded 
we need to keep learning so that we are well equipped to deal with the new ways of teaching. The next one is the heart. Very, very important. Yes, the head is important, but the heart is also extremely important. Uh, Gunita, can you, can you continue my sentence here? The heart of the matter is... The Gunita, heart. are you there? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The, this is heart. not a complete sentence. The heart of the matter is... What is the next sentence? What is the next phrase? There you go. Um, it's a matter of the heart. Wow. Yeah, bekerja, uh, mengajar, berelasi, itu yeah. semuanya adalah masalah hati. Ah. So the heart is important. Like yes, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Masalah yang utama adalah masalah hati. Itu loh. The heart. Okay. Now let's look at the heart of a teacher. Now here is a, a teacher who went to see a doctor because she felt that her heart grew a little bit. And uh, after some examination, the doctor told her, this is what happened. Hey, don't worry, your heart is slightly bigger than the average human heart. But that's because you are a teacher. Unita, can you touch your heart? Can you yes. feel that your heart is bigger? Yeah, it's beating. <laughs> <than> other, <laughs> it's beating, it's also bigger than other people's heart, yeah? Okay. Now, here are two things that I want us to remember. Number one, uh, the heart of the teacher is the heart that has a lot of passion for teaching. And number two, uh, the heart of a teacher is, you know, the heart that has a lot of passion for learning. Here do a help. Pertama, passion for teaching. And the other one is passion for learning. Okay. Passion for teaching. Yes, knowledge is important. Yes, teaching is important. Planning your lesson is important. But when you are in the classroom, when you deliver your lesson in you know, relation to having your students in class, this is where your passion as a teacher comes into the picture. Here, students are usually looking for a teacher who is caring, especially uh, those students who need help the most in the classroom. A passionate teacher is, is somebody, is a teacher who has very good rapport with their students, good relationship. They know every single student in the classroom. They know their needs, they know their strengths, and they know their weaknesses. Good relationship becomes very important. Interestingly, research also says that uh, humor, the ability to tell or to teach a lesson in a humorous way is also uh, an indication of the uh, key characteristic of a teacher who is passionate about their teaching. Enthusiasm. I think you know about this when you walk into the classroom and you are excited, you are enthusiastic about your lesson, chances are your students will also feel the same way. Oh, my teacher is very excited today. I'm sure she has something exciting to share with us. Next one, very important, likable. Mm -hmm. A passionate teacher is somebody who is able to reach out to everyone and to, to, to get everyone to say that, well, I like my teacher and because of that, I want to do the best I can in order to learn from a lesson. Are you a likable teacher, Ibunita? I'm sure you are. I think I am. Yes. And uh, the last one is motivation. Motivation is very, very important. I, you know, somebody mentioned this, a senior educator mentioned this, that there are three things in education that are most important for us to remember. The first one is motivation. Ibunita, the second one is motivation. motivation. And the third one is? Feel motivation. Motivation, very good. Three things about motivation, yeah? Three things about education and all have to do with motivation. Why is motivation important? Now here is my uh, understanding about the place of motivation in teaching, which I will summarize using six words, all beginning with T. So six T's of motivation. The first one is the teacher. Now interestingly, the first T, the teacher is the most underutilized element of motivation. But to me, the teacher continues to be the most important source of motivation in the classroom. When your students are not motivated, it's probably because of you. 
not your teaching materials, not your teaching methodology, but it's you. Maybe the way you talk, maybe the way you relate to the students, maybe the way you dress even, or maybe your hairstyle, everything about you can have a motivating effect or demotivating uh, effect. Number two, teaching innovation, the ability for teachers to use innovative ways of teaching. That is also a great source of student motivation. If you come to class every day with the same way of teaching, good morning students, today we are going to talk about the present tense. Please open page 20. Is it page 20 or 25, Bonita? It doesn't matter, but, <laughs> but you get what I mean, yeah? So we need to find different ways of teaching. Next, text, multimodal text. In the old days, we use print materials, but today with technology and everything, I think we need to begin introducing multimodal text. Uh, my colleague, uh, Paul Goldberg, later will share with you uh, his X reading, which is multimodal and which is uh, digitally uh, mediated materials, very good for developing your students' English language proficiency. Next, the next T is the task. I think nowadays it is possible for us to develop tasks uh, that are digitally mediated using some form of you know, applications or digital technology to get the students more excited about the task. The uh, paper and pencil kind of task is no longer, I mean, sometimes you can use that, but I think we need to explore the use of the uh, newer ways of developing tasks in the classroom. The tests, I think this is very important too. Our test tends to be very traditional and uh, very often our test has nothing to do with things that the students are uh, expected to do outside the classroom. So our tests will have to be authentic. In language teaching, for example, our tests will really be a test of student speaking ability, their writing ability, not a multiple choice test, for example. And finally, this is another T, the last T is teachers need technology. Teachers need to develop their technological skills. Some teachers have been saying, I don't think technology is going to replace teachers. Do you agree with that, Bonita? I think I agree with that. You agree with that? I don't. Technology will not replace us. Oh yes, I agree. Yeah. Yes, 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 yeah. I agree. <laughs> Absolutely, I am with you on that. But, right. but that sentence, is not finished. Yes, teachers who don't know or teachers who know how to use technology for teaching will replace those who do not know how to use technology. Mm, yeah. I think that is that something very important for us to remember. It, it is happening now and 10 years down the road, if you don't know technology, if you don't know how to use technology for teaching, I think that will be the end of your career. Okay, second one is the passion for learning. A great teacher has a heart that has a lot of passion for learning. Look at this, nothing is impossible, yeah? The word itself is I am, says I am possible. And that is the kind of attitude that teachers need to have. Yes, times are tough. But at the same time, there's a silver lining and you have to create that silver lining. You have to look at the uh, challenges as opportunities for you to learn great things. And I would like you to share with you a book written by this lady, a professor of psychology from the States. Now that book, if you ask me, if I were the Minister of Education, I would make this book a compulsory reading for every single teacher in Indonesia and in the world. That book is really, really amazing because the message that the author is trying to get across is this, that everyone can be successful. You do not have to be the most intelligent person in the world. You do not have to be the most talented person in the world, but as long as you have this, you will be successful in whatever you do. You need to have passion and you need to have perseverance. This to me is a very, very uh, amazing combinations 
that can help us become more successful. And in that book, this is what she says. She has a formula for success. The first formula says this, if you want to learn a skill, for example, how to use the uh, digital technology for teaching purposes, then you need some talent. Talent here means that you need to know how to use your hands, you need to have a computer, you need to know how to operate a computer, a laptop and so on and so forth. More importantly, you need effort, yeah? Effort plus talent. And that's how you develop a skill. But the next one is this, if you want to be very, very good at doing whatever you want to do, like teaching with technology, for example, then you need another set of effort. So skill plus effort is achievement. And that is what success is all about. Isn't that amazing? So everyone, let me say this again, everyone can be successful. Ladies and gentlemen, I, we have discussed the head and the heart and now time for me to look at the hands. Now we're looking at the hands now. Yes, the head and the heart are important, but the hands are key to successful teaching. The hands are key to us, you know, being able to use online tools and being able to know how to use them for teaching purposes. And teaching, again, is a skill. And I was reminded of this book by Malcolm Gladwell. And the title of the book is Outliers. And in that book, he talks a lot about how people develop their expertise, how people develop their skills in doing whatever they want to do. Uh, athletes, for example, uh, musicians, how much time they spend in order to develop expertise or world-class uh, players, for example, whether golf players or, you know, uh, piano uh, pianists and things like that. And he said, you need 10,000 hours of supervised practice. For us teachers, I don't think we need 10,000 hours to become a good teacher. I think if you spend some hours, like 50 or 100 hours, you'll be able to develop a, a good skill in using technology. Now, I consulted my colleague who has done a lot of work, who is very knowledgeable about a wide range of applications that can be used for teaching purposes. And the name of the person is Finita Dewi from UPI Bandung. UPI is Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia uh, Bandung. She is very good and she is open to invitations. If you are interested, I will send you her email address. Now, these are five top tools that teachers can use. Yeah, I'm going to share with you now. Number one is screencasting tool. Number two is presentation tool. Number three is online sticky note. Padlet is an example. Uh, number four is control practice tool. One example is Kahoot, uh, Quizlet, and some other tools that are available out there. And finally is uh, productive tools. Uh, for example, Canva or Flipgrid for learning. There are many tools out there. You do not have to learn every single one of them. I think what you need to do is just to select to choose maybe three or four or five that are the most useful for you to use for your teaching purposes. The hands, teachers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have some tips for you. Number one, this is in the actual teaching, in the actual online teaching. Remember, online teaching is different from uh, classroom teaching. Yeah, tip number one is speak less. Do not speak nonstop for one hour. So 15 minutes is good. 10 minutes is even better. Longer than that, the students will get tired and they will switch off uh, very soon. Number two, another important thing, remember the uh, teachers early on that I mentioned to you, a uh, passionate teacher who is able to motivate your students, work hard, use your charm to stimulate to motivate you to come to your class prepared so that in class you can spend a lot more time uh, you know doing more important things in uh, during the session with them uh, increase the amount of interaction as well remember that knowledge is socially constructed yeah so the amount of interaction that you do through collaborative uh, activities is going to be useful the next one is variety 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 use different ways of doing things. You may have noticed, I use different colors, yeah? 
so that you don't, you don't get tired of seeing the same black and white on the screen. And that took me a while to prepare the PowerPoint slides. Next, three more. Remember, your clients are your students. As a good teacher, you need to sit to seek feedback from your students. Ask them, is there anything missing? Is there anything that is boring in my lesson? And tell me so that I can improve on it. So we need to have an open heart for that. Uh, okay, teaching is not online 100%. It is going to be a mixture, a balance between synchronous online and asynchronous learning as well. We need to make use of the uh, pluses and minuses of these two ways of engaging our students. Finally, finally, very important, we need to adopt the right mindset. Let me share. Yeah, share the right mindset. The mindset is that, yes, times are challenging. Yes, it is not easy for me, but I can do it because I'm a teacher, I have a big heart. I'm a teacher, my head can also grow by you know, upgrading my knowledge, my professional knowledge and so on. We can grow uh, during this difficult time. So ladies and gentlemen, we have looked at the, uh, the head, the heart and the hands of a good teacher during this difficult time. Now here is a quiz for you, Bonita, a quiz for you. The biggest obstacle to success is one word, three letters. One word, three letters. Yes, the biggest obstacle to success is, and the first letter starts with, with Y. You. Yes, <laughs> that's you. The biggest obstacle to success is you, because I'm talking to you, yeah? Uh, but if you talk to yourself, then the biggest obstacle to success is me. Yeah. Not other people, it's me. And number two, I would like you to refer to that book by Carol Dweck. Success depends on your mindset. Mindset. Now, this lady is very interesting. Another psychologist from the US. This is what she says about people's mindset. There are two types of people with different mindsets. The first one is, you know, the first one are, you know, those people with the uh, fixed mindset. Lihat ya gambar kunci itu ya. Mindset is closed. Now this group of people believe that ability is fixed. Well, I'm from Manado. What do you expect from me? I have grown enough. I am happy the way I am. Itu ability is fixed. If I put in more effort, I'm just wasting my time. Effort is fruitless. If people give me feedback, I will just say, no way, not for me. And finally, very important, I am always threatened by others' success. When people are successful, I am not very happy with that because that threatened my existence. But there is another group of people with a growth mindset. Now, this is very interesting, and I hope you will learn how to adopt this growth mindset. Mm -hmm. Ability can grow, whether you are a man, a woman, whether you are young, not so young, or a senior person, you can continue to grow. If you are 60 years old and you say that, well, I'm 60, what do you expect from me? I think you are wrong. People can bloom multiple times, even when they are 60, 70, or even 80 years old. So ability can grow. And for these people, effort is number one. If you put your heart in it, and if you put more effort in it, you will be successful. These people also accept feedback. They're happy to accept feedback and criticism from other people. And they are inspired by other people's success. If Nita is a very successful, excellent teacher, I will come to her and I will ask her, Nita, please tell me your secret. Of course, Nita will say, yes, I will tell you, but you have to buy me lunch. For dinner, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. So, so these are the three things that I want to share with you. You know, a great teacher uh, in the new normal is somebody who has a big head, a big heart, and a very skillful hands. Thank you very much. Uh, if you want to download my slides, you can visit my 
website. Uh, Willie's ERG Corner, and that's the QR code and also the uh, website address, www.willyrenandia.com. Thank you for listening. Nita, back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Pat Willie. Very insightful presentation. So, yeah, the head, the hand, and the heart. Yeah? Yes. Very important. Okay. Uh, for those who are following this webinar through YouTube channel British Council Indonesia, if you have questions, you may just post your question in the comment box. Now we're going to move to the second uh, speaker. Um, the second speaker will be Paul Goldberg. Paul, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Osaka, Japan, and I will sh start sharing my screens. Uh, start sharing the screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, like I said, my name is Paul Goldberg. I'm based in Osaka, Japan. I'm not from Japan originally. I'm from New York. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about extensive reading in a time of crisis, an introduction to extensive reading and X reading. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off with what is extensive reading, in case you're not familiar with this concept. Uh, it's a practice of reading large quantities of text that is easy to understand. So students are reading a lot for books that they can understand almost all of the words. Okay. It's based on Stephen Krashen's input hypothesis, which says if students are exposed to large quantities of language that they understand, they will begin to acquire that language. Okay. Um, it is basically in contrast to intensive reading, which is short and difficult reading, the kind of reading students are typically doing in school, preparing for exams or standardized tests. Okay. Uh, the basic principles, uh, which really originally come from a book from Richard Day uh, and Bamford, Julian Bamford, called Extensive Reading in the Second Language Classroom. Uh, their main points are, number one, students are reading for meaning. Now, of course, we think, well, we always read for meaning, but not really. When our students are in class, they are typically reading for language. They're reading to understand, to see how well they can understand. Uh, but extensive reading, they're actually reading to understand the story. Uh, the text has relatively few unknown words, which was what makes it easy for them. There's an emphasis on fluency over accuracy. In other words, they should be reading as quickly as they can, as long as they understand the story. They don't need to be understanding every word or the grammar perfectly. Uh, the text is relatively long and therefore graded readers are ideal for doing extensive reading. I'll talk more about graded readers in a moment. And students often select their own stories. And that way they're getting stories that are more interesting for them because everybody has their own unique interests and it'd be nice for students to be able to choose a story that they find interesting and gives them a sense of empowerment, something students often are finding themselves lacking of. Okay. Uh, the benefits of extensive reading, there's again a lot of research. I'm gonna go very briefly through these. Uh, one, students see a purpose to reading. Uh, which is to enjoy a story. And I don't think that can be understated how important it is and how natural it is for people to be engaged in stories, whether it's TV, movies, radio, or books. Uh, students can enjoy reading because they're getting engaged with stories. Uh, vocabulary is recycled, which leads to actual learning, not just memorizing, memorizing words. I think this is the pedagogical heart of extensive reading. Uh, what Stephen Krashen was getting to, that by reading a lot, students will start to see the words that they are familiar with in multiple contexts. And then they begin to actually learn those words, not just memorize them like on a flashcard and not really know how to use them. Similarly, students' understanding of the words they know is expanded because they get to see how words are used in what context, and things like that. Uh, and reading speed and fluency improve uh, there's a lot of research showing that uh, by doing extensive reading, students will increase their reading speed, which will help them even on things like standardized tests. Okay, why extensive reading is essential? There's lots of different analogies 
teachers often give. Um, analogy I like most is tennis. I don't know if everybody watching uh, this uh, right now, my presentation, are very familiar or play tennis, but I'm sure everybody's at least familiar that there's a game called tennis. And you can imagine if this guy wants to become the best tennis player he can be, what does he have to do? Okay, well, the first answer is very obvious. He has to practice the skills. Again, maybe you don't play tennis, but you can imagine the skills are for uh, serving, forehand, backhand, leg work, footwork, uh, strategy. Those are the skills of tennis. And he has to practice those skills every day. But will only practicing the skills actually make him a very good tennis player? Probably not. They'll make him good at the skills, but not necessarily good at competing. What he also has to do is practice playing. Okay, it's probably so obvious. No tennis coach would ever tell his student, just practice the skills. You don't have to practice playing. That's just fun and games. But that's what happens all the time in language education. We have our students memorize vocabulary, learn grammar rules, practice pronunciation, but very rarely using these skills in a meaningful way. That is the purpose of extensive reading. Okay, for those of you who like a more empirical evidence, we'll say, uh, there's a lot of research out there. Um, my favorite is uh, what I like to call the 200,000 word threshold, where these researchers found that when students read 200,000 words, they started to make significant, statistically significant gains in their English ability. Now, 200,000 words might sound like a lot, but it's actually very possible. If you can get your students to read 15 minutes per day, they will be able to do this. And I'll, I'll show you because with extensive reading, again, with students choosing easy books that they understand the vast majority of words, they can read about 150 words per minute. Uh, just for some context, a native speaker is about three to 400 words per minute. But a student with easy text can read 150 words per minute. If they read for 15 minutes per day, how many, day, how many minutes will it take to reach 200,000 words? About 1,333 minutes. If you divide that into days, it'll take about 88 days. Okay, certainly a substantial amount of time, but, but reasonable. Intensive reading, I'm not very familiar in Indonesia with Indonesian students, but my background is mostly in Japan, Korea, and China. That when students are doing intensive reading with very difficult reading passages, they need a dictionary. The dictionary has many meanings for every word. Therefore, they have to go back to the context, try to guess which is the correct meaning, go back to the dictionary and confirm. In that situation, it's about 17 words per minute. If a student reads for 15 minutes per day, how long will it take to read 200,000 words? About 11,000 minutes or over two years. So I think that makes a very strong case why extensive reading is necessary. It's the only way students can encounter enough words while reading. I'm not saying intensive reading should be ignored, but we need a balance between the two, just like a tennis player needs to practice playing, but also needs to practice his skills. Okay. Um, I think extensive reading is really best summed up in, in Christine Nuttall's seminal work where uh, she talked about what happens with reading, the reading effect. So with difficult books, students don't understand well. If they don't understand well, what is the result? They're going to read slowly. If they read slowly, what is the result? They're not going to enjoy reading. If they don't enjoy reading, they're going to read less. If they read less, as you can imagine, they're not going to improve their understanding. And this is a vicious cycle where students never improve. Let's look at easy books. If a student understands a book well, what is the result? They can read quickly. If they read quickly, what is the result? They'll enjoy reading. If they enjoy reading, they will read more. And as you can imagine, if they read more, they'll increase their understanding. This nut all calls the virtuous cycle. And that's what extensive reading is all about, making extensive reading a reading pleasant for students, okay? Next, I'd like to just talk briefly about graded readers, which are the main tool for doing extensive reading, okay? These are books from multiple publishers, Pearson, Oxford, Cambridge, Macmillan, they all have graded readers. 
Uh, there are storybooks written specifically for adult and young adult, even children's uh, language learners. There's a range of levels, which is why they're called graded readers. Uh, and what makes them different levels is they have controlled vocabulary and controlled grammar, being simpler at the lower levels and more complex at the higher levels. The emphasis is on the story, enjoying a story, not so much on the activity. Some books have activities, but the emphasis is on the story. And they often have audio narration, so students can practice listening to the story while they're reading. Okay, uh, so graded readers are what students use to do extensive reading. In normal times, they would go to the library. Most universities or high schools have libraries where students can get the books. However, these are not normal times. This is unfortunately the age of COVID-19, meaning libraries are unfortunately not available for most students. Uh, therefore, the solution, one possible solution is something I have been working on. I created it uh, as part of my uh, doctoral work and implemented it in my university. It became quite successful. It's called X Reading VL. It's a virtual library of graded readers. Students can access anywhere, anytime with no limitations. The mission is simply making extensive reading easier for teachers, more accessible for students and profitable for publishers so they're willing to support a system like this. A quick overview. It's an online library of over 1200 graded readers from almost every major publisher. Uh, and we're constantly adding more. It gives unlimited simultaneous use, means every student can read the same book at the same time, which means it's not just a library of 1,200 books, it's a library of 1,200 books for each student. Works on computers and mobile devices, and we have audio, quizzes, background information for every book. It is then linked to a learner management system, something like Willie was talking about earlier. These are a learner management system is an online tool that allows teachers to connect with students, something that is absolutely essential these days. The benefit of an online system, it allows teachers to track their students' reading progress, assess if they're understanding the stories, and guide their selections. Okay, as I said before, it works on computers, it works on tablets, it works on smartphones. I'm gonna give you a quick demonstration how the system will work for students, okay? Uh, as Willie pointed out before, students are not always very tech savvy. So we made it as simple as possible. Students need to do just three things. Log in, select the book and read. And hopefully they can do that without too much difficulty. So I'll show you how that works. The student logs in, they can see the add book button they press that and they are taken to a library of all the books. They can browse or narrow by your typical criteria, level, genre, uh, things like that. They can start reading immediately or they can get more information about the book, similar to being in a real library. They press more information. They can see the back cover summary and the metadata. How many words? Is it British English, American English? Is there audio? How many minutes is the audio? Things like that. Text preview. They can read the first 5% of the book before they choose it. Audio preview, they can listen to the first minute of the audio to see if it sounds pleasant to them. Character lists, students often complain one of the most difficult aspects of reading is keeping track of all the characters, especially like the classics. So we're in the process of creating a character list for every book, okay? And finally, ratings. I wish I could say every graded reader in the world is wonderful, but that is not the case. Some are better than others. Uh, so by having ratings, which are from other students, it will direct students to the better books, okay? Um, so we're gonna choose the book, sorry. Press select book here. And this is what it looks like when a student opens a book on a computer. Most important to notice is the top left, there's a progress bar. So when the student presses next, you notice the progress bar moves forward. We could go back, but we will continue going forward and the progress bar moves forward, okay? When a student stops reading, it will save their position. So if they're in school or at, you know, even at home and they read to chapter two and they stop and they come back later, it'll bring them right back to chapter two. Okay, I'm gonna close the book. And this is probably the most important slide for educators. This is all the data that gets tracked for your students. So we're reading a little princess, it's level two, it's 2044 words. It tracks how many words we've read. 
it doesn't know for sure that we've read 326 words, but that's how many words are on the screen. So it can calculate the percent, 16%. More importantly, it tracks our reading time, 22 seconds. This is very important for two reasons. Number one, it can therefore track our reading speed, which is what extensive reading is all about. It's a great way for teachers to know if their students are reading at a suitable speed. The second benefit is it can let teachers know, is the student really reading? So if I was to, if I was to see my student with a reading speed of 445 words per minute, I would be very suspicious. Okay, so it's actually a very good way to catch students who are cheating if that's a problem you're encountering. And you might say, well, a student might log in and open the book and walk away. It won't work that easily because there's an activity timer built into the book. If they open the book and walk away for a minute, after 60 seconds, a pop-up will come and says, hello, are you really here? If they don't reply immediately, the book closes automatically, okay? Um, some additional features for students. Uh, number one is the digital book. Um, and therefore you can change the view settings. You can make the print larger, the spacing larger. You can even change the background color, which could be useful depending where the student is reading. We have quizzes for every book, five question, multiple choice. Very easy if a student has actually read the book. Uh, students can rate, uh, sorry, read the book. Students can rate the book when they finish and that's where we get the ratings. Another nice feature we have, I talked about audio. Publishers make audio for their graded readers. However, they tend to put it on CD, not very useful. So with X reading, the audio is on demand. Students press the play button and they can listen while they're reading or listen instead of reading. Uh, however, unlike reading in which the student controls their speed with listening, they're typically forced to listen at the speed of the narration. Therefore, we have included a very unique feature, multiple speeds. The original speed, 10% uh, slower, 20% slower, 10% faster, 20% faster without distortion. So the students will hear a natural voice even at the faster speeds, okay? Typically, I'd like to give you a demonstration, but because to save time, uh, I'm gonna move on. Another feature we have is if you are teaching a listening class and you want your students to practice specifically listening, there's a setting here called text and audio accessibility. You can turn off the text and allow the audio. And this is what students will see. So they're forced to listen. Okay, so that's everything for students. How about for teachers? Well, the main thing for teachers is to be able to view your student data. So this is the classes page. I can see all of my classes and get a quick summary what my students have done in this class. I can then choose one class and I can see every student and instantly I can see how many books they read how many words they read, how many minutes they read, their average reading speed, and their average quiz score for every student. This can be exported to Excel when I need to do grading. I can then select a specific student, and I can see every book the student has read, when they read it, how much they read. Also, I can set a minimum passing score for the quiz or a maximum reading speed. If they are outside of those parameters, they will get flagged, or in this case, marked in pink, not letting the student get credit for that book that they probably didn't read, okay? The other thing the teacher can do is restrict the library. So there's something called library access and all of these criteria, the teacher can restrict the library. So for example, these are the 14 levels we have. If the teacher unchecks any, students will not see books at those levels. The setting I use most often is words in a story. I don't want my students choosing very short books. My students are reading one book a week, so I don't want them choosing very short books. So I will just uncheck, uncheck, uncheck. Oop. And the shortest books my students will be able to see will be 3,000 words. And let's say you want all of your students to read the same book. There's benefits to that because they read the same book. They can engage in more interesting activities. So I'll go to select specific title. I chose just one book, The Elephant Man. Now, when my student presses add book, guess what? They will see only the elephant. Uh, some additional features we're working on for later this year and next year, a, a leaderboard, which will allow students to compete with each other to be the top reader in their class or in their school or in their country. A speed reading component that will actually get students to uh, make a concentrated effort at improving their reading speed. 
a vocabulary learning component, uh, which they'll be able to choose from different lists, whether it's graded reader words, TOEFL or TOEIC words, or uh, the new general service list. And finally, an interactive dictionary that will allow students to tap on a word and instantly get the meaning of that word. And the teacher control, can control the dictionary, either make it English only, bilingual, or turn the dictionary off. Okay. Uh, finally, I should mention, uh, just you know, for full disclosure here, it is not a free system. It's there's no other way to be able to get the books from all of those publishers if they were not being paid. And therefore, there's a cost for students, but I believe it's quite reasonable. In Indonesia, the price is a is $14 per year per student. Uh, and discounts are available for institutions. Uh, the cost for teachers is free. So anybody who's interested in trying something like this, please contact me. Thank you very much. And my contact information is at the bottom. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Nita, back to you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Wow, very interesting, yeah, about extensive reading. Um, guys, I have one question here before we proceed to our third and the last speakers. We stop for a while for a question and answer, just a short one. I've got a question from Denny Abdullah, and I guess both but Willie and Paul can respond to these questions. Uh, the question is like this, which one is more effective in giving and delivering the materials and instructions in remote teaching? Should we combine both video and ebook? So this is the question from Denny Abdullah. Hmm, Paul is an expert in that area, Paul. Well, I couldn't quite understand the question. <laughs> I, th I, think, I, think, I think they're useful uh, in different ways. I think both are useful. Uh, but, you know, in a typical remote learning uh, situation, uh, the ebook will be something that the students would need to read before they attend the uh, video session, so that during the video session, you can engage the students in a deeper conversation, in a deeper discussions about the content of the book. So both are useful, but they're useful in different ways. But during online learning, you can also provide e-materials as well. It doesn't have to be e-books, but it can be anything uh, that you can you know, create uh, using the uh, digital technology. For example, if you, you know, assign your students a, uh, a graded reader from Paul's X reading. I mean, that is an example of an ebook that the students can read together during the session, maybe briefly for maybe for five minutes and then followed by discussions. Yeah, so my answer is that they're useful in different ways. Oh, okay. okay, I think yeah. there's actually one question specifically for Paul. Mm. Are nonfiction reading available in X reading? Oh, I'm currently teaching vocational classroom and we are in need of nonfiction reads with available mm -hmm. audio. Yeah, oh. I, absolutely. I, I, I don't know offhand, but I believe about a quarter of the books on X reading. So probably about, well, maybe about 200 books are nonfiction. Uh, so we certainly have a lot of those. We have the Cengage footprint series, which actually have lots of images from National Geographic. Uh, we have a lot of biographies. Uh, at the same time, though, pedagogically, I don't know if nonfiction is as suitable for extensive reading. The reason for this is that nonfiction is generally going to have a lot of technical words. If you think about it, there's almost no topic you can write about that, that's a nonfiction topic that's not going to have some technical words. And technical words are typically unknown words for students. If they have a, too many of these unknown words, it stops being in extensive reading and becomes more like intensive reading. Okay, uh, so again, X reading can certainly be used with nonfiction. We have lots of nonfiction, uh, but generally extensive reading, I think, is more suitable with fiction. I don't know if Willie wants to add anything to that. Mm. Yes, I think, I think there's, there's this mistaken assumption that mm. when you teach uh, in English for specific purposes or English for vocational purposes, for example, nursing students, then you have to provide materials related to nursing uh, matters only. I think that is not the way to go. Uh, in my experience, the majority of our students have lower proficiency. And because of that, they are not able to read almost anything. 
-hmm. you know, either fiction or nonfiction, either vocational related books or non-vocational related books. Uh, the best thing for you to do will be to strengthen their foundation, their general proficiency in the language. The vocational reading will come very, very naturally. It will be very easy uh, for me, for example, to read any kind of, of books, as long as I have the language and I know the content. One for, thing I'm yeah, for, for many of the students that you have there, they don't know the content and they don't have much language to begin with. I think we need to work on the language first. And the best way to work on the language is through extensive reading. And X reading is one excellent platform for your students to develop, to develop that level of proficiency. Paul? Yeah, one thing I was gonna to add to that, I'm not sure if you're uh, aware of this, Willie, we are actually, are, for the upcoming year, one of the things we're pushing is uh, fiction graded readers, but with a theme of different majors. So right now we're working on a series of business oriented graded readers. They're all fiction, like, like a TV drama, but mm -hmm. they take place in a business world. So they'll be having topics that are probably even more interesting to business majors. Yeah. The next series we're gonna be working on is actually for nursing students. Mm. So I, I think, but again, they're fiction so students can get kind of emotionally connected to the story, something that doesn't mm. happen as much with uh, nonfiction. Yeah, yeah, good answer. Okay, I think we can continue the discussion after the last presenter. Uh, thank you for the participants who have already posted this question. Now I'm, I'm giving the chance for our third speaker. I invite Pat Colm Don't to deliver the presentation. Pat Colm, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nita. And I'll just start sharing my screen with you. Um, greetings, everybody. Hello, I'm Colm. I'm the Director for English Education and Society at the British Council, and I'm based in Jakarta. And I'd especially like to thank Teflin and Teflin Eastern Indonesia. So greetings to any English language teachers and professionals from Sulawesi, Maluku, or Papua that are joining this, this special webinar. Um, I'm going to be talking about the impact of COVID-19 uh, internationally and how English language teachers and ministries of education around the world have been responding. So I'm just going to get my screen shared with you. One second. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. All right. So this is the title of my presentation, Embracing the New Reality. And there's a screenshot I took from a uh, Twitter post uh, a few days ago. This is from UNICEF Education. And you can see a picture of two Indonesian uh, children, sisters, uh, studying at home or playing at home. And I'm sure that this is a kind of a picture that's familiar to many of you as teachers and as parents across Indonesia. But what I'm going to, well, and um, I, I'd like to start off actually with a story. This is a fiction story, linking back to the previous comment and a short one for you. So this is a, a story that I read about in the Jakarta Post newspaper um, earlier this month. And it's a story of or, you know, it's a representative story, really, of the challenges faced by teachers in continuing education during these difficult times. And I think that this, this is a, a picture of some teachers from Sulawesi, if I'm right. Um, these are some teachers in Bawang. And uh, as you can see from the story on the right, uh, the story is basically saying that whilst a lot of education has moved online, um, not everybody has access to the tools or the data connection that they need in order to, to receive that material. And so these dedicated teachers, is, you can see at the end, it says every Monday, they are traveling by foot for around 20 kilometers, which involving climbing hills and crossing a river in order to drop off assignments. And they go through the same journey again every Saturday to pick up the tasks to be checked. So you know, extremely Im impressive dedication by teachers in Indonesia and around the world to maintain this kind of education uh, for their learners despite the, the, the pandemic. Um, 
you know, many, as it says here, it goes on, the article goes on, it says, many teachers across the archipelago, especially in areas with limited access to electricity and internet, have gone that extra mile to stay in touch. Um, so really today I wanted to go through a few examples from around the world um, and to show you really that here in Indonesia, you're not alone, that these are challenges that are being faced by teachers um, everywhere. And you know, what are the kind of ways in which ministries of education, schools and teachers are responding to that? So let's just have a look at some data to begin with. This is uh, taken from a UNICEF, uh, or, oh no, this is a UNESCO uh, website. There's a link at the bottom. And this is actually during, um, you know, this, this data was taken from the third, sorry, the 4th of March. And it was one of the, you know, it was at the peak of the pandemic across the world. And here you can see, you know, just how many learners, over a billion students being affected, over 91% of learners around the world at that point were, were being affected. Um, schools in the majority of countries were closed um, in over 194 countries. If we jump forward to Tuesday earlier this week, um, this is the situation at the moment, according to UNESCO. So you can see the pictures changed a little bit. Uh, in some countries, in Australia, for example, and in some of the, in France and in Sweden, Norway, um, schools have been able to reopen. Um, that's also the case in, in Vietnam um, and in Japan, but not everywhere. Um, you know, the, the large parts of the world, COVID-19 is still creating a major challenge. And, you know, a, a lot of schools, 107 countries, schools are still closed in those areas. If you're interested in data, you can also have a look at the World Bank. This is a similar map uh, presented by the World Bank showing uh, which countries have been affected by COVID-19. And you can see here, it points out that in Indonesia, schools generally are still closed as a rule. And that's affecting 68 million students. You know, a tremendous number of students that have been affected and teachers and all of you, I'm sure, watching this webinar, um, you know, have been affected by, by COVID-19. So one of the things that the British Council has done, um, we've been working with ministries of education and teachers around the world. And we did a survey a month ago to, to find out more about the challenges that are being faced by ministries of education and by, by schools and by teachers. Earlier this week, um, there was a presentation uh, around the results of that survey. Uh, that was on the 21st of July. If you go to our website, you can see a recording of a, that webinar that goes through the main results. And these are the names of the two reports. You can also find the reports on our website. But I'm gonna give you a glimpse uh, into some of the findings from that report. So it's separated into two reports. One is interviews with ministries of education and uh, observations that they've made. And the second survey is more specifically with teachers and talking to teachers uh, and asking them what are the sort of biggest challenges that they've faced. So let's hear, again, this isn't Indonesia. This is um, ministry, 52 ministries of education from around the world. And let's go and have a look and see what, oh, what they have said. If I can move on to the next slide. So some of the main findings. One of the sort of common findings was that there has been more significant learning being provided asynchronously than synchronously. And I think Pat Willie briefly mentioned that. So asynchronously is obviously when learning takes place at different times. So this is an indication that more teaching is, is happening through sort of tasks being sent to students, maybe by email or by WhatsApp. And then students will do that at home, uh, maybe you know, with support from their parents. Uh, and a little bit less learning is taking place synchronously, you know, like live remote teaching. And there's, you know, 
it's quite understandable when we consider that a lot of students may have difficulty in accessing um, these kind of live synchronous tools. They might not have a laptop, they might not have a strong data uh, connection or package. But there is a, an inconsistency in terms of um, the approach at the moment. People are sort of struggling to respond quickly. What we also have found is that this has been a steep learning curve. Whilst remote teaching has been around um, for a while, it's not something that teachers are very familiar with. I mean, teachers are used to teaching in schools, face-to-face -face in the classroom. So whilst there's been a gradual um, move towards, you know, trying to encourage teachers to embrace technology, it's a new, it's a new thing. Um, and teachers definitely need to develop the skills in order to make, you know, to fully exploit the, 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 the opportunities or the potential that these sort of digital tools present. And at the moment, they, you know, are doing their best, and I'm sure you're all doing your best to learn new skills, but it is one area that they are, you know, there's still a need for around the world. Um, and we have found that whilst there has been some support for teachers to develop those skills, at the moment, there's not a scalable approach. So there may be, you know, small initiatives um, by ministries of education or by professional networks like Teflin, uh, which is great. And it's useful for small numbers, relatively small numbers of teachers to develop those skills, but it's not a scalable um, national approach at the moment, which definitely is something that needs to be developed. In terms also as you know, one of the effects really of trying to do things quickly is that there can be some areas that have been maybe neglected and that need to be reviewed. So we have found that in over two thirds of the countries that we we've looked at, there was an absence really in sufficient guidance around child safety and online safety measures in using digital tools. Um, and this, you know, some of these gaps are an indication of trying to respond at speed to the crisis. Some of the, the main challenges, again, from around the world, and um, they are the same challenges that we face here in Indonesia. One of the most frequently cited has been around, again, connectivity, ability, you know, availability of devices, and also the cost of data, which is a big concern for, for many learners and parents. Um, and as for the, the teachers and students themselves, um, in addition to those sort of accessibility and, and data issues, the, the biggest challenges, most common challenges faced um, has been around learner motivation. You know, how do you keep your learners engaged and motivated online? Um, much harder to do that than in the classroom itself. And assessment, you know, assessment, how do you stop your students from cheating, maybe if they're at home, they're going to ask their parents or use Google Translate. Um, so these are, you know, two common areas. Um, I know teachers in Indonesia have talked to me, that these are concerns of theirs, but you're not alone. These are concerns of teachers everywhere. So that's a little bit of, about what we, we heard back from the Ministry of Education uh, around the world. When we interviewed teachers and looked at the needs that teachers have, here are some of the, the things that they've said. So we interviewed over 9,000 teachers, um, a lot in East Asia. When we asked them how they're teaching, uh, again, you can see here that the majority were teaching asynchronously. Um, only, and only 59% of the teachers we interviewed said that they were teaching using synchronous tools um, like a webinar or uh, Zoom that we're doing at the, at the moment. When we asked, again, what are the sort of challenges? We touched upon motivation and assessment, but this is the list of, of the, the main challenges that te English teachers around the world expressed. Um, so you can see here, assessing remotely, class management, and keeping up on, sh on student motivation how to prepare you know, their, their learners for exams. You know. So these, I think these will be familiar to you. Um, what we've done as an organization is try to respond to that by providing some guidance and support for English teachers 
and ministries. And on our website, you'll be able to find um, a series of remote teaching tips. Uh, we hope to be getting uh, in Indonesia. We are hoping to put one of our British Council BBC programs on television. And I'll talk a little bit more about television in a moment um, to, to give some uh, resources that are accessible for, for all learners. And that's a link if you're keen to find out more of our guidance and tips um, for remote teaching. And in the pipeline coming soon, we have a, a, ten, a series of 10 new um, you know, uh, guidance and tools and, and training sessions, which we were calling professional practice pathways for remote teaching. So you've heard it here first that these are coming soon. We've also developed a series of lessons specifically adapted for uh, remote teaching, both asynchronously and synchronously. So let's move on. That is really uh, the results of our survey that we've done. What I really, uh, what I want to do in the, the second part of my presentation is highlight some case studies uh, from around the world, different examples of, of uh, what teachers have said and good practice uh, that I think uh, you will relate to. Um, again, here is some more data from, uh, in this case, it's from, this is from UNICEF. And this shows you that the issue of, um, you know, access to digital devices and data is a, a problem around the world. And you can see here that, I think if we look at Indonesia, looking at the color of Indonesia here, I would say that maybe up to 50% or between 50% and 75% of the population has no internet access at home. Um, so you can see that whilst countries are trying to move online, finding offline or low tech uh, solutions has been increasingly important to make sure that people are not left behind. Um, so the guidance really is given the digital divide, um, it's really important that we use multiple delivery channels in order to, to keep education systems going. You know, and that kind of makes you think back to the first picture I showed you of those dedicated teachers jumping across the river to deliver lessons um, and pick up, pick up assignments from their students. This is a teacher in Brazil. Uh, let's have a look at her, her sort of testimony of, uh, of, of, of her context and what, and what she has done in response. So this teacher called Deborah, she works, she says, in a community that has very few resources. Um, and infrastructure and connectivity issues are a big problem. You see? However, whilst in her context, whilst the teacher, the students maybe didn't have a laptop or a computer, a lot of the families did have mobile phones, um, maybe simple smartphones. And so what she's done is she started using WhatsApp and Facebook with her classes and she started sharing short videos, giving them kind of instructional tasks and sending those tasks via, via WhatsApp and via Facebook, um, which they'll read on their mobile phone in order to give them an activity to get on with. Again, this is asynchronous in its approach. And I'm sure, again, this is um, familiar to many of you, uh, you, know, th you know, tuning in today, I'm sure you've been using a, a similar approach. So again, it's not, you're not alone. This uh, teacher, Kavita from India, um, she, again, if we have a look at her testimony, and she has said that, she, again, we wanted to help students with their mental health. And so on our school Facebook page, we created live events every day from Monday to Friday, where we could reach out to our students through yoga, cooking, music, games, quizzes, and stories. So that's quite interesting, as well as yeah, the importance of you know, trying to do classes and deliver educational content, 
that in this example, you can see that they were thinking about their students' mental health and well-being. And so they set up um, you know, a regular slot on their Facebook page where they could do these kind of well-being initiatives and activities. Uh, this is Anne from the Netherlands. And Anne, you know, she makes the very, you know, the, the, the point that as a teacher, you know your context better than anybody, you know your students and you know what they need. Um, and her sort of advice or experience has been positive in that she has been part of a network of teachers and educators from across the globe, uh, exchanging experiences and sharing knowledge. So I think that's another, you know, a good point to take away that whilst you're at home and you sometimes you might feel a bit lonely, um, the best way of dealing with these challenges is to reach out to other teachers in your, your school, in your community, to be, you know, be part of a you know, community of practice and, and learn from each other. Today, we're all across Indonesia, but we are supporting each other as a community of practice too. Um, you know, so we're all one big family facing these challenges together. In, this is an example from Pakistan. In Pakistan, um, the Ministry of Education worked closely with uh, the national television station in order to put on educational content on television. And they also invited different um, civil society groups, different organizations, to develop content and put that on television. So one organization, the Citizens Foundation in Pakistan responded to that by preparing a you know, weekly one hour episodes um, where they focus on um, English language, but also different sort of areas as well. And they're all on, on YouTube. I think it's really interesting that a number of countries are using television as a medium for continuing education around the world. Here's a picture from Kenya, where you can see this is a 12 year old student at home, uh, you know, following a lesson on television. Clearly uh, this student doesn't have a computer or a laptop, but they do have a television. Um, UNICEF said that television is being used by 75% of countries around the world. Um, in order to continue education. Radio is also being used. It says 58% of countries have reported using radio. Um, in addition to sort of television and, and radio, uh, here's an, an example from France. Here there, uh, you know, there's a partnership with the French postal system. Um, so here they're doing two things. Apparently the, the French postal system has a digital interface. So they are sending homework and receiving tasks via the French La Groupe La Poste online um, portal. But they are also, it says the second option whereby you know, digital resources are available in schools. Sometimes these are printed and sent home to families via direct postal delivery. So this reduces the need to, to leave home. And I think it's important that as well as sort of digital content, it may well be necessary to print hard copies. And you can see in, here is an example in Senegal, they're saying that the Ministry of Education here is offering hard copies of some online resources via physical handouts at the regional bureaus of the Ministry of Education. So, you know, if you don't have a phone or a, or a laptop, you might be able to go to your regional Ministry of Education office and pick up um, resources and tasks and exercises for you to, comp you know, to work on. In the UK, the British government has set up an, an entirely new online school. It's called Oak Academy. And that school is, at the moment, it's a, 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 an initiative where there's about 300 teachers from across the UK that are right now developing a thousand lessons as a backup in case schools don't open so that schools across the country have a digital resource and some standard, standardized high quality uh, online lessons to make use of. If you're interested in 
finding out more about that initiative, you can have a look at the, the Oak National Academy uh, website. Uh, as you can see, because they're online, it says they're very proud. They're going to be open for all of 2020 and 2021. They're not going to be closing. They're only an online school. Many countries have been working closely with professional associations. So here is an example of the British Council is working together with NELTSA. This is the Nepalese English Language Teachers Association as a response to COVID-19. They've been delivering different webinars. They've got another one tomorrow. Um, this is on enhancing creativity and imagination among students. And you know, this is just an example, you know, and here's a, a quote from, you know, talking about the importance, again, of communities of practice. Um, you know, these professional association groups are in, in an incredibly uh, important way of, of keeping teachers across the country connected and updated. And obviously here in Indonesia, I'm very happy that the British Council um, has supported different associations. So ITEL, the Indonesian Technology Enhanced Language Learning Association has delivered a series of webinars in response to COVID-19. And of course, Teflin itself with uh, you know, uh, a huge membership. And uh, so we, these are the, the previous webinars that we delivered and this is the third today. Um, I'm aware of time. I've got about two more minutes, I think, to get through uh, with some lessons learned from all of this. So one of the things that we have learned um, or that people are learning is that constant communication is essential. Um, whilst everybody's at home, um, it's, you know, parents, learners, teachers, you know, if there's not regular clear communication of what resources are available or what the schedule is on TVRI for the education programming, then you know, a lot of learners and parents and families might miss out or misunderstand. So there needs to be this, this regular communication at all levels um, in order for this kind of remote learning to succeed. We need to use scalable technologies to reach everybody. So again, this use of um, television and radio is, is one example. Um, you know, that gives fair and, and equal access to, to all learners. Um, this is a, a quote from the Ministry of Education in Mexico, and it is talking about how its, its partnership with uh, Telis Sudaria uh, is being used, and it, it you know they're they're reaching over 21 percent of the the entire population through this approach. Flexible digital pedagogies, um, again using different digital platforms um, in order to reach learners is 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 the, another key kind of takeaway. So not just high tech uh, synchronous zoom meetings like this but a combination of you know i think you've been using google classrooms and email and whatsapp um and you know making a telephone call to parents or students where necessary so again using a variety of different approaches is is key the last i'll put them all up because i'm aware of time um this is i think my penultimate slide Again, it's just to, to reinforce these kind of key takeaway points. There need, the evidence that we have suggests that there needs to be more focus on providing high quality resources. So we need to really improve the quality of the resources uh, available to, to teachers and students and guidance uh, in using those resources. We need to create more opportunities for teacher development uh, so that teachers can learn these new remote teaching skills um, and make that scalable so that all teachers have an opportunity to develop those skills. We need to better understand the barriers to access and try to develop solutions for overcoming those barriers. We need to take a fresh look at different forms of assessment. Um, obviously, this is you know, one of the most challenging things to do remotely. 
Um, and I think that that is a, a, an area that we're going to see a lot of uh, innovations over the, the, the next couple of weeks and months as COVID-19 continues. And as people move online, you know, we've got to really go back and think about the child safety measures and guidance to make sure that learners are safe when they're using online platforms and tools. And lastly, more needs to be done to support and incorporate the role of parents because they're the people at home uh, who are in a new position now having to you know, manage and look after and guide their, their children um, in supporting them on throughout this, you know, this, this, this remote teaching. So getting parents involved and supporting parents and talking to parents about what children need to do. Okay. This is a blog from the World Bank, which you can see on my slides if you want to read more about how people have been responding to COVID-19. Um, that was launched earlier this week. I highly recommend it. And never forget why we do all of this. It's for the learners themselves and for their future and for their education. And I know that's why you're all uh, dedicated teachers, um, because when students are you know, managing to learn and have fun, um, it gives you the satisfaction to keep going. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for your efforts uh, across Indonesia. And I will, um, I will end my presentation there. Sorry for going a little bit over time. Thank you. Thank you, Pat Column, for a very nice presentation. Um, just a gentle reminder that we're still welcoming questions from the participant through the comments box in YouTube, because there will be another session for a question and answer after this last speaker. I would like to invite Ibu Anik to present your material. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ibu Nita. I'm going to share my PPT. So can you see it, Ibu Nita? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ani Nunuulyani. I'm working with Pak Khairil Anwar Korompot from Universitas Negeri uh, Makassar, and I'm from Universitas Negeri Malang. So here is my uh, presentation, Learning Disrupted, Learning Rethought, Lessons from COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, first of all, here are the points that I'm going to, we are going to discuss. So we are going to to discuss the definition of um, crisis as the theme, main theme of the talk today, and then also disruption. And then um, actually I was just repeating what Pa Willy, what Pa um, Paul, and also Pa um, Calm Downs about um, learning before and during the pandemic. And then I'm also talking about multiple learning modalities, which I um, take from UNICEF um, website. And then we are going to talk about uh, the data from our online survey here in Indonesia. So if PACOM actually um, have seen it from a bigger point of view from uh, throughout the world, we are going to focus on Indonesia and then uh, I will also share UNICEF's key considerations and recommendations. Okay, let's start with uh, the definition of crisis. Um, Dictionary-wise, then we know that we have different definition of crisis, but we need to pay attention to the second definition. A condition of instability of danger as in social, economic, political, or international affairs leading to a decisive change. And then uh, what can we learn more about crisis? That between the 19th and early 20th centuries, actually um, crisis may, uh, may start from the various political events, conflicts and states of emergency. So when we are talking about crisis, it's usually related with war, for example. But in contemporary discourses, then it may be caused by economic problems, natural disaster, and catastrophes. And we are talking about catastrophe here when we are talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. Disruption. 
Disruption is very interesting word. What I understand is actually it is more negative because it sounds like interruption in doing things. But then we also know that it has um, a change actually, a change. Um, in business and also in education, disruption may mean innovation actually. This is very interesting word, disruption. Now let's continue to the main point. Uh, Pak Kont, um, Pak Willy, and also um, Pak Paul has mentioned about um, different ideas or different ways for us um, in learning actually. Before COVID-19 pandemic, we know that most of teachers and students would uh, go to school, stay at school, and then do the face-to-face -face, uh, learning. Blended learning, yes, only a little bit. Online uh, learning, yes, it's also much fewer, uh, more, uh, fewer than blended learning itself. Okay, what happened during COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, so we shifted from um, has to to go to school and then we have to stay at home. The teacher um, have uh, the teachers have to work from home and the students needs to study from home. And then uh, we combined um, the teaching, not only through blended learning. Um, what I mean is that uh, in my experience, actually, last semester, I actually still do the face-to-face -face meeting for a half semester. And then the, uh, the, 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 the last half of the semester, we do totally online learning, okay? So that's what happened and um, everyone are quite familiar with the situation. Um, and here are some actually, um, I've asked some friends um, what they use uh, during, uh, before COVID-19 pandemic and during COVID-19 pandemics. So there are not much different actually from the online platforms that they use. They use WhatsApp, they use email, they use Google Classroom, and then they also use Zoom. They also use uh, institution uh, learning management system and also Edmodo actually. Uh, but as you can see that Zoom or WebEx or Google Hangout actually not too familiar for most of us. Me, myself, I have to confess that I know Zoom from my nephew. So my nephew was studying in um, Islamic Pesantren, or, or we call it as boarding school. And he has to went back home um, to our house. And then um, he shows us about the use of Zoom. And I was thinking, oh, what about using this for my own classroom? So I learned from him actually. Um, and then uh, when we delve um, deeper, then we understand that there are actually large inequalities in access to technology. Um, if you are from rich family, then it will be, you know, you are more, um, you are in a more disadvantageous position rather than if you are poor. And then if you live in rural areas, you cannot access uh, the technology because we usually don't, we don't have Wi-Fi in the rural ar areas, but in urban areas, yes, you have it. Even in um, sometimes girls are also quite disadvan uh, in a disadvantageous position than boys in some countries, you know, like in Bangladesh, this is based on um, UNICEF's um, in, um, data that they may need to work for the family or taking care of the you know, brother or sisters. So they are more disadvantaged, a disadvantage here. And then um, across countries and within countries. In Indonesia, when we are talking about Indonesia, we are talking about Sabang to Merauke. And the access are also quite different from one place to another, from one province to another. Even if we are talking about my city, we are talking about Malang. Um, if you are living in the city like in Malang Kota, the city of Malang, it will be different with if you are living in um, Malang Regency or Kabupaten Malang. So if I go back to my parents' house, actually I cannot access the internet 
without using my mobile data, um, mobile data connection. Okay, so here is what UNICEF mentioned about Pak Kom actually mentioned that multiple learning modalities. So we need to use various um, ways to be able to um, to stay connected with the students. So students and teachers and also the school and also the government. So we could see that sometimes the range could be from no technologies and to a lot of technologies that can be used. And then you also have the platform, the high tech modalities and the low or no tech modalities. So what can be learned is that um, UNICEF mentioned about home learning modalities metric. So there are, there are four learning classification and then um, we have low or no tech self learn and then it is also self learning, low, no tech, but then it is teacher guided learning. The third is high tech self learning. The fourth is high tech teacher guided learning. So here is the picture. So as you can see, um, the self learning, okay? So this is what happened. So perhaps you use the books, radio, TV, and if it is teacher guided, then the teachers sometimes do the home visit like what Pak Kong, um shows us uh, uh, what happened in Sulawesi. It also happened in Malang, actually. Um, I remember that my sister-in-law has to um, stay at school and then the parents would take the, what is it, the, the printed materials, bring it home, and then later on submit to schools or just picture through the WhatsApp uh, picture, send the picture to the teacher. Why another school, still in Malang also, uh, my nephew, another nephew is actually um, doing everything digitally. So with video conferencing and things like that. He also, he also learns uh, with the parents. So now we will come to the online survey uh, from Indonesia with 500 peoples from 34 provinces. Pak Hairil, over to you. Okay, Bu Ani, thank you. So uh, what Bu Ani is going to talk about uh, is based on a survey study that uh, uh, she and I uh, have, have, are, uh, have been working on in the past few weeks. So it's not conclusive. Uh, what we have got so far are the uh, preliminary, preliminary results only. Um, so basically it's a survey study on Indonesian English language educators and the pandemic. Um, this is based on the background, uh, which I mentioned early in the, earlier uh, at the beginning of this webinar. Uh, given the background that uh, COVID-19 is a global crisis uh, with both positive and negative long-term effects. And we know that teachers, students, and institutions have been greatly affected in both good and bad ways. So uh, the questions that we have here um, uh, here in the survey is, the first one is, uh, online, online learning is not new, but uh, what about switching it, switching to it in its maximum extent? Um, and then um, the second one is, how do we all, I mean, do we teachers and lecturers in this case, uh, cope with this and the challenges that uh, this uh, poses? Uh, the third question is, are you ready for the implications of this uh, new normal for English language teaching in the short and long run? And uh, what do experts, teachers and students, governments and communities in Indonesia and the rest of the world have to say and offer? And in this particular context, our study looks at uh, Indonesian English language teachers. So uh, what do we, uh, what did we ask the respondents? Uh, uh, and I'm sure um, some or many of the uh, uh, viewers out there uh, participated in the survey. Uh, thank you for that. So the survey sub, uh, survey sub topics include uh, the first one, uh, the respondents biographical information, including jobs. Uh, we wanted to know whether they're school, school teachers or university lecturers. The second subtopic, uh, how the respondents rate their levels of English. 
English teaching skills conventionally, uh, English teaching skills with technology in general, uh, English teaching skills online in particular. The third subtopic is uh, uh, the respondents access and use of the internet for teaching online. The fourth one is the respondents professional activities during the pandemic, or in this case, the working from home uh, period. And then the last one, challenges faced by the respondents in teaching during the pandemic, working from home. Yeah, uh, over to you, Ibu Ani. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Khairil. Um, <clears throat> the next part, as you can see, Ibu Bapak, um, that actually, um, this is, uh, we are going for, for this presentation, we are going to pay attention to the third point, which is about the access, actually, access to the internet. Um, okay, so the first one is availability of infrastructure and internet connection. Actually, from 500 res respondents, we have a very um, promising result where most of them actually said that sangat memadai, which is very good and also good, okay? And the next one, <clears throat> whether you have, um, there is internet connection, um, the speed of the internet connection is good or not. They said that most of them also agree that it is very, uh, very good, 17.66% and 67.6% actually said that good. Now, what about affordability? Um, they said that it is affordable. Okay, the urgency of the internet connection for teaching online and also for distant learning. Yes, it is also very important. Not a single person actually said disagree. <laughs> and then the smartphone usage, this is what Pak Kolm also previously mentioned that actually um, they use smartphone here in Indonesia from 500 um, respondent. We have 55 0.4% uh, actually say always and then frequently okay, using smartphone for iPad or tablet, not too much, not too many of them. And then using computer or desktop uh, for desktop or laptop, yes, it's also quite frequent. And then whether they have home internet subscription. Uh, and luckily, it is only um, one third of the respondents have, uh, have the home internet subscription. And then uh, student access to smartphone, tablets, and computers. This is very interesting. Previously in United States, it was about, I don't know how much, I forgot that um, in United States, oh, 20%. Yeah, in Indonesia, actually, uh, when we asked them, uh, asked the teachers whether the students um, has some difficulties to access the uh, mobile phone, tablet or computer because of their economic condition. The answer is 73% says that yes, they do not have the access because they have uh, economic um, issues. And then most of the teachers actually also use their own money. Thank you, Ibu, that use their own money, okay. Uh, use their own money uh, for the support of the internet. And so what can be learned from home learning modalities metric again? Um, if, Ibu Bapa, you can see the recommendation and considerations. You can, you can check on the recommendation and consideration, but it's actual, they are actually very similar to what Pak Kong has mentioned because we are talking about the same sources. Yeah, use combination of learning modalities and then working with others, okay? But most importantly for me myself from the recommendation here, I would like to encourage this, the school leaders and governments and also teachers themselves to, uh, to, what is it? To maintain their well-being. Well-being is very important, not only well-being for the teachers, but also for the children and also for the parents and caregiver. Everyone is shifting from one way to another because of COVID-19. So I think that's what we can say, but we haven't, we haven't done any um, analysis 
for the result of our study. Thank you, Ibu, over to you. Okay, thank you, Bu Ani, Pak Hairil. Uh, I know it is still an ongoing research, yeah? so we're looking forward to the result in the future. Okay, so we still have a little bit of time, about 10 minutes for question and answer. And apparently there are quite a lot of questions uh, asked by the participants, but we have, you know, unfortunately we just need to select some because of the time. Uh, I chose one from Charlene Waro. And this question is addressed to Pak Column and Pak Willy. How to make sure the authenticity of students work? How do teachers deal with this problem if just in case it happens? Please, okay. Pak Column will start. Yeah, I'll just say a, a few comments on that. I think personalization of tasks is incredibly important. Um, firstly, it will be motivating for learners. You know, they'll have, you know, to, to ask students a, a real question, give them a real task, you know, get them to, to write a paragraph or a few sentences about what they're doing at home. Um, you know, you know, I think whether you're in the classroom or you're, you know, you're teaching remotely, authentic real questions and real tasks are incredibly important. And the other huge benefit of having, you know, personalized tasks is that they will require an individual response. And then teachers will be able to, you know, assess that response and get a really good indication of that learner's um, learning, you know, their, their use of English. Um, it, doesn't necessarily have to be individual. You could give a, a, a task to a group of students, maybe ask them to collaborate, you know, three or four students together and, and write a, a play, a remote play, a script, or make a short film. Um, but I think the kind of personalized tasks can be extremely motivating and a very good way of getting, um, for teachers to get an indication of, of you know, what learning is, is taking place by, by that student. Maybe okay. you want to add something. Mm. Uh, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the question. Uh, oh. of authenticity of students' work. I, yeah. think, I think it could mean, if I'm not mistaken, uh, whether, whether the work that the students did is actually their own work, or is it, is it a copy and paste kind of work? Is mm. that probably what they mean? What the, what the person who asked the question mean? Uh, if that is what what it means, then you know, uh, asking open-ended questions will be the way to go. I mean, multiple choices out of the question. Uh, if you are testing their communication skills, for example, you can ask them to do a simple presentation using this a lot of applications right now. Uh, can't remember the name, uh, but it's, it's 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 very easy to use. The students can have their you know their talk uh, recorded. On their mobile phone and then they can send the link to the teachers for assessment yeah okay right um here's one other question from fatlan Saini. Mm -hmm. how can teachers engage in this learning while the skill of students in using technology are still low mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, you know, we have to start from somewhere. We, we have to start someplace. Uh, you know, one of the first things you need to do is to, for the teachers themselves to learn how to use the skills and then they can, you know, uh, teach the students how to use that skill that the teachers pick up along the way. I mean, they have to, we have to start somewhere for that to happen. I mean, everyone is, yeah, everyone's learning about how to use technology. I am learning too, and uh, I'm still struggling with, you know, uh, how to effectively use technology for teaching purposes. Hmm. I, I would just, yeah. add, I think okay. on, on using smartphones now, I mean, first of all, as, as Willie just said, it's very easy to make a, a short recording. Um, hmm. you, know, you can film yourself, and, or you can do an audio recording and you can send that, and that's that's quite simple to learn how to do. Um, even for very young learners, they could be working on paper, you know, on with their at home with a pen or pencil. They can write their sentences, 
and then their parents can take a photograph of their work and send it to the teacher you know so they don't necessarily you don't have to write or type on your phone or on your laptop you can work on paper and take pictures of that um, you can use free apps to turn it into a pdf and again i think uh, I would say that Indonesians are much more technically savvy mm. um, at using mobile phones than the students in the UK. So mm. I think that the, the skills are there. Um, and it's this combination of, yeah, maybe old school techniques using pen and paper, but mm. simply taking photographs, making videos, making audio recordings, and sending those through to your teachers. Okay. Yes, good answer. Right. Okay, now I move to Bu Anik and Pak Hairil. There is a question from Nuri Rohma. Would you mind giving us details, the demographics of the targeted audience for your survey? Like how many are teachers and how many are uni lecturers? Uh, thank you, Ibu. Um, well, Bu, I don't know, Bu Nuri Rohma here. Yeah. I said, yeah. Um, sorry, um, I made a mistake here. Yeah. Um, um, our targets are Indonesian EFL teachers, Indonesian EFL teachers, and then 23.2% uh, of the 500 respondents are teachers. We are talking about um, nursery teachers, and then also um, kindergarten, um, primary schools, um, secondary schools, and then also language courses. And then, um, sorry, not 23, but 76.8 are teachers, and 23.2 are um, academic staffs or uh, faculty staff or docent lecturers. So most of them are teachers, English teachers, from um, primary school or nursery school to secondary school. I hope it answers Ibu Nuri Rohma. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bu Ani. And now moving on to Paul. Paul, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yep. Okay. Many are asking about the online library websites. Okay. They're very interested in joining and they're asking, is it a free subscription or what? Can you please say something about it? No, unfortunately, because we partner with the publishers, I have to pay them to put their books on X reading. Uh, so in Japan, it's approximately $25 per year per student. Uh, and the publishers have agreed that for Indonesia, it will be $14. Uh, although depending on the institution, the size, um, potential discounts could be given. If, if anybody wants to email me, uh, I can you know, let them know what's available. Uh, yeah, I, I wish we could make it free, but the publishers would then not allow to have X reading, you know, not allow their books to be on X reading. Okay, right. Thank you. Sure. Now, I think we have come to the end of our webinar. Is it still possible to give the speaker like one closing statement before we close? Starting from Pak Willy, closing statement. Sure. Uh, yes, a very short one. Remember, in the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned about that the fact that that you know uh, every cloud has a silver lining. Do not wait for the silver lining to come to you, but you can create your own silver lining. So a lot of learning opportunities out there, and it's a great way. The time is, I think, right for everyone to start learning how to use technology for education, for teaching purposes, and also for self-improvement. There's a lot of things that we can learn uh, from what is available technologically out there. Kom? Yep. OK, thanks very much, Willie. Uh, I'll take on the baton. Um, I think, actually, <laughs> my closing remarks, I'm going to back up Willie and Paul and talk very briefly about reading and something I've been saying as a teacher uh, for many, many years. But as they said, if you want to improve your vocabulary, if you want to improve your, you know, your range of, you know, the, your English, you've got to read, and you've got to read as often as possible. Um, you know, I I make this comparison with like if you want to get fit, 
Uh, you, you can't run a marathon without training. You need to do a little bit every day uh, to build those muscles. And it's the same with reading. If you can dedicate 15 minutes, 20 minutes every day to do a bit of reading and read what you love, read, you know, whatever you're passionate about, whatever you're interested in, and, you, you know, you'll be more motivated to understand those texts. So as teachers and for your students, get them into that habit of doing a little bit of reading for pleasure mm. every day and, and mm. keep word lists and, and learning collocations and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, get reading everybody. Yes, okay. huh? I, I like that, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I can't agree more with uh, what was just said by Colm that, yeah, I mean, I, I developed X reading because I believe students need to do extensive reading and it's really, I mean, even when in the best of circumstances, without a crisis, it's difficult for students to have access to appropriate materials. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and obviously, in this time, it, it's you know more difficult, sometimes impossible. Uh, interestingly, what I've seen is with my the data that we collect with our system, is that students are actually reading more this year than they ever have before. So that is that maybe the, the silver lining is that students, because they're home. And they can't go out as much is that the, the amount of reading they've done is, is at least on our system is probably about 40 percent more than it's been in previous years per student so that's a you know a good sign okay. if, if yeah if the price is too high speak to me and i'll speak to paul about that <laughs> <laughs> okay all right buani please uh thank you Ibu. um i just would like to um encourage all English teachers. If you do not have resources, you can contact Paul and also <laughs> <laughs> and then most of all, uh, please work with the community of teachers. We have Teacher Voice in Facebook and also we have IERA, the, um, the organization for extensive reading and I'm one of them actually, part of the, uh, I'm the members. So I'm really happy that um, Actually, there are more and more teachers uh, interested in it. Uh, so that, again, I would suggest please join the community of your uh, around your areas, or even you now because we can do it online. Just spread your wings. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Pahiril, maybe. Okay, I would like to say uh, three things. Maybe beginning with uh, don't forget. Uh, number one, don't forget that you're not alone. Uh, we are in this together. We are learning. Uh, this is a learning curve and everyone is learning. And no, nobody knows exactly uh, what's the perfect thing to do. So you're not alone. Number two, don't forget the disadvantage students. Uh, um, you, you can't let them, let them be, uh, leave them behind. So uh, if you, uh, by, by any chance you have students who don't have uh, the gadgets, they don't have the laptops or desktop you know, uh, smartphones, uh, think about something to help them. And the last one, um, uh, don't forget that we have uh, organizations like Teflin uh, and Teflin Sumapa in this particular instance that are there for uh, you all, teachers and lecturers, uh, to get help from. And we will try our best to uh, be the resource or the resource, the resource people for you. Oh there. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much all. I guess from today's presentations, we have learned a lot and we have widened our horizon, especially during this time of crisis. Uh, just to make sure that we have to keep healthy and stay motivated. Yeah. So it can still be productive, even in, you know, in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic era. Finally, on behalf of Stephanie Sumapa Regional Board, I would like to thank all the speakers and the participants. Yeah, you all did a wonderful job today. And for sure, the British Council Indonesia. Without you all, this event would not have been a success. And for the information to the participants, there will be a link to materials, a certificate and feedback survey that will be posted in YouTube channel. So make sure you note this feedback. Yeah, please give your feedback and then you can download the materials and the e-certificate in this link. 
And please note that these links will be valid until tomorrow, Friday, 13 hours walk to Indonesia Barat. Yeah? So you can calculate your own time. Finally, before I say my goodbye, I think I will give the chance for each speaker to say goodbye. And it's from Pak Willy. Goodbye now, everyone. See you again. Until you meet again. <laughs> Paul? Uh, well, I was supposed to come to Indonesia for the first time in my life this year. I'm disappointed I couldn't make it, but I really hope I'll make it next year and, and get to meet everybody in person. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, please say sayonara. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to all of you at home for giving us your time. Um, sampai jumpa. Uh, I uh, many thanks to Hyrule and Tanita. I haven't been to Papua or Maluku yet. Um, I have been to Sulawesi, and I, I'm looking forward to coming back to Sulawesi. And I very much hope to explore more of Eastern Indonesia and meet many great teachers um, across in Eastern Indonesia when the situation allows. So I, I hope to meet you in person when it's possible. Take care, everybody. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bu Anik? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Teflin Sumapa. Thank you, uh, British Council. Okay. Thank you, Pak Willy. Thank you, Pak Khairil, and Pak Paul, and also everyone uh, who helped us um, to get through these activities. And thank you, participants. I hope you learned a lot from our presentation. Thank you. Okay, Pak Hairil. Okay, thank you. Uh, just like uh, Pak Kom, I haven't been to Maluku and Papua myself. That's why <laughs> uh, in the background you see the, uh, the bridge, the new uh, bridge in Jayapura. I really want to visit this bridge one day. Uh, it's a dream. I hope it will come true. So before I go there, I say hello to everyone and thank you very much for joining the webinar today. See you in person someday. Okay, thank you. Well, finally, we have come to the end of our today's webinar. Uh, all the best, everyone. Have a nice and fruitful day and see you at our next event. Goodbye. Bye. Well done, Ibu. Nice job. Done. Well done, Ibu. Well done. Great. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Are we still live on YouTube? <laughs>